And welcome to another edition of Sanctified Reason. Sanctified Reason is a podcast where Dan Delzell and myself, Sonny, them sit at the crossroads of faith and pop culture and discuss the issues from a biblical perspective. And Dan, if I was to say, hey, I've got good news that I want to share with you, chances are you probably would think initially that it has something to do with the tangible life that we live here on earth, like maybe it's job related or maybe it's something, you know, with social stuff, friends or relatives, or, you know, maybe it's news about vacation, you know, whatever it might be. When you hear good news, a lot of time we think about something tangible that's going to affect us here on earth. But when you talk about good, but then let's say your question would be, okay, what's the good news? You'd probably inquire about it. And I start quoting scripture to you. You might be taken aback or confused at first thinking, well, I thought this was about good news. And what people don't realize is that the gospel is also referred to good news as Jesus tells us about, you know, how we can get salvation and spend eternity in, in heaven. And then from there, a lot of times you will come across different questions and, and ideologies and beliefs and stuff like that. But I guess the one thing that people really don't realize is that as you write in an article, the gospel is God's spiritual dynamite. It has the ability to blow up any obstacles, any hard heartedness, any concerns, any anything that a person might have that would keep them from accepting salvation. And so I thought that might be something we could uh, talk about here to get going on this podcast is the, the good news, the gospel is God's spiritual dynamite. Yeah, it really is, Son, isn't it? Just in a whole league by itself, because when we talk about good news or people say, well, I got some bad news today, it's just like you said, it's it's almost always related to uh, something like a health issue or a job issue or a financial issue or a relationship issue, all of which are important to us. They're important to God. And they affect our lives very much. But we use the terms good and bad as they relate to how it's going to impact us generally. And when we move into the realm of of Scripture and the gospel, we are now all of a sudden dealing with uh, an area that addresses our immortal soul, which is so far more important than our earthly body. Uh, our, our body is important to us and to God. It's the temple in which God lives within all who believe in Christ, but it's very temporary in the big scheme of things. So good news for the body is one thing. Good news for your finances is, 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 is one thing. Um, but, but good news for your soul takes it throughout eternity. And we're not generally thinking that way uh, in our daily life until we are born again spiritually and our eyes are opened and we start to see that there really is um, this this free gift, this good news of eternal life, that, that Jesus did come from heaven and lived a sinless life and died a perfect holy death on the cross so that we could be forgiven and have eternal life with God in heaven. And then all of a sudden we start to look at things, not just from an earthly perspective, but most importantly, from an eternal perspective. So you're exactly right in, in saying that, that that good news is, um, way beyond anything that we typically think of as, as good news. This is great news. This is extraordinary news. We can't even find a word to describe how good it is because it will never end. Um, th- there will never be an ounce of anything bad in heaven, anything painful, anything, you know, negative, uh, harmful, sinful, you know, fill in the, the, the blank with all the different terms and adjectives, but, uh, but this good news song is like anything else in all the world. In fact, it, it's going to take us 
beyond the world as we know it uh, to a place the Bible uh, refers to as uh, the new heaven and the new earth. And so um, that's the, the blessed hope. Uh, and when I use that word hope, and the scripture uses that word meaning an assurance, uh, the blessed assurance of our eternal life is with the Lord in heaven because the good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Um, that's on a whole other level from, you know, 99.9% of the things I would say we talk about in this world that are good news, that, that, that one thing, when we, when we get into this, that, that, that 0.01% of things we talk about happens to be uh, a million times better than, than anything else that, that could be good in this life. Uh, because again, in this life, it, it's only temporary. Uh, eternity is forever. Yeah. You know, we've often talked about works. A lot of people believe you can work your way into heaven. A lot of people think that there are multiple ways to get to heaven. But when it comes to this thought process of the good news, you write that you can actually believe your way into heaven, you know, repent and believe the good news. And then like you referenced John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So when people go about their theological world and they're talking about working their way into heaven or finding alternate routes to heaven besides, you know, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not too many many people stop to think about the prospects of just believing your way into heaven and following what the scripture says when it comes to repent and believe the good news. You are exactly right, son. It's not natural to to think that way. It's not natural to believe that. It's a supernatural, um, it really a supernatural message. Uh, uh, you know, um, Jesus had the words of eternal life. Literally, the words of eternal life. Now, stop and think about that. Um, you know, eternal life is conveyed through words that are believed. That that's just in and of itself. So, just incredible. But but that's the way the gospel works. The Bible says that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So, yes, as it says in the article. Uh, a person can believe their way into heaven. Uh, now, uh, you know, right away, then the skeptic, the critic, you know, will say, oh, yeah, you know, so you mean you can just say you believe and then live however you want to live? Well, um, that really uh, is, a, is a straw man argument uh, because nowhere in the Bible does it ever describe uh, Christianity uh, that way. Following Christ is just, um, you know, say you believe and live however you want to live. What happens in the real world, not in that make-believe world of, of straw man arguments and, and uh, criticisms of, of Christianity that aren't even, um, they're not even addressing the real issue. Um, in, in the real world, uh, and this is in the spiritual world, in the real world, you believe your way into heaven by accepting the good news by trusting in Jesus as your Savior and the Holy Spirit, who's working in that message to bring you to faith, then comes to live within your body, which becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are then instantly saved, redeemed, justified, born again, forgiven. All of these are terms that the Bible uses to describe the person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, but, but it goes against the grain. It goes against man's nature natural way of thinking. And it also goes against man's pride because we, we want to earn our way. We, we, we don't want to be told that we're, we're sinful and, and, and that we can't earn it. We can't pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and, and do something to earn it. Um, our pride, um, you know, forces against that, fights against that, doesn't want to accept that. We want to be the ones who get the credit and do the work. But the Bible says that's impossible because no matter how hard we might try to be good or be righteous, uh, you know, the Bible says all of our righteousness is like filthy rags to God, meaning that if we rely upon that and we present that before the Lord and say, here, Lord, you know, is this enough to get me in? It doesn't even come close because God requires perfection. 
perfection because he is holy, perfectly holy. And, and it's because God requires perfection that the only way our sins could be paid for was by Christ dying on the cross for our sins. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Scripture says that if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In other words, if we could get there, that natural way that we, we tend to think we, we should be able to get there, if we could get there by working our way there, then Jesus died for nothing on the cross. And, of course, he didn't die for nothing. He, he, he died to save all who will believe in him and receive the free gift. Or, or as it says in one of the final verses in the Bible, uh, Revelation twenty two seventeen, it says, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift gift of the water of life. And, and, you know, you would think, son, going back to just this idea of good news, you would think that anybody presented with that message would say, hmm, let's see, heaven, hell, um, one's a free gift, you know, the other's where I deserve to go because of my sin. Uh, I guess it's a no-brainer. I'll take heaven. You know, anyone in their right mind would take heaven, okay? The problem is this. Sin is has blinded man's mind to the truth. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, the God of this age, small g, referring to, to Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, uh, who is the image of God. So it's a spiritual deception. It's a spiritual blindness. And, and, it, and it's a spiritual message and the spiritual power of God, the supernatural power of God, that has to break through that, that, uh, that blindness, that veil, uh, which scripture talks about, which covers the eyes until you turn to the Lord. You know, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the Bible says the veil is lifted. Jesus' first sermon was repent and believe the good news. Repent means change your mind. You know, you're going one direction, you're going away from Christ, turn to him. You know, surrender your life to him. Say, Lord, you know, I'm a sinner. Wash me, Jesus, with your precious blood. I receive your free gift of eternal life. It's faith. You know, faith is what connects us to God. Faith is what brings forgiveness. Faith is what brings a person to be born again. And it, it is so against the grain, though, of our natural inclination and our natural assumption, uh, which is, well, hey, I, I, can, I can earn my way there. I can work my way there. And, you know, son, if you ask 100 Americans, what needs to happen in order for you to go to heaven? You are going to hear most people answer something like, well, you know, I need to live a good life or I need to, you know, live by the golden rule or I need to do more good than bad. It's all going to be about what they do. But, but when a person becomes a Christian, when you're born again spiritually, you, you suddenly realize, wait a minute, I could never be good enough to get there on my own. Uh, Christ died for me. He paid the price I could never pay. My faith is in him. As it says in, a, in an old hymn, um, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So that's the blessed assurance of a Christian. Not, oh, I, I've been good enough to get into heaven, or I hope I've been good enough to get into heaven. No, the Christian, the Christian knows that we're not good enough to get into heaven. Uh, now, we try to live a good life, not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved. In fact, son, I'll take it one step further. The Christian can even grow in their, their faith to the point where he or she knows that heaven is their home. Now, now naturally speaking, you know, a person would say, well, how arrogant are you, you know, to say that you know you're going to heaven? Well, stop and think about that. That's only arrogant if you're basing that on what something you've done. But if you're basing it on what Christ did, which is what the Christian gospel proclaims, then it's not arrogant at all. Um, because you, you, your, your hope is not in what you've done. You know you fall short. You know you're a sinner. But you're trusting completely in what Christ did for you. And, and Paul describes this uh, as a righteousness from God that then covers our soul. Um, and it's, it's a righteousness that comes to faith in Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a glorious, glorious thing to hear the gospel. It's even more glorious to believe it and to be saved, to be redeemed. How can I know if I'm born again? Well, um, am I trusting in Christ and his cross or in my works? Okay. And, and, and one other thing I would throw in there, um, do I want to live for Christ? 
Because if a person were to say, well, yeah, I, I believe in God or I believe in Jesus, but yeah, I'm not really too much into that living for him. Well, then I would say, um, you know, I, I would I'd try to say kindly to that person. Well, it doesn't sound at all like you're born again, be, be, because if you're if you're born again and God's now living inside you, you're going to want to live for him, not in order to be saved, but because you've been saved. So that kind of gets rid of that that straw man argument of those who say, yeah, you just say you can believe. And then, you know, you, you can say, well, I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to go live like hell and it's okay because you know i'm i got my ticket punched to heaven well that, that's never been um the christian message and that's never been the experience of anyone who's ever been saved you know that, that you, you don't um you don't find that in the hearts of people uh who have the holy spirit living in them where christ has come to live within them you simply don't have people saying that because that's just not uh the fruit of faith that 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 would be um you know the, the the fruit of somebody who's trying to you know pull one over on god and 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 frankly son i don't even know i know that argument gets put out there but i don't even know if i've ever even really heard anybody even try to make that argument yeah i i believe in in jesus but but i don't want to live for him so it really is um uh, it's, it's a straw man argument um the gospel changes hearts and the gospel is good news because it it addresses our immortal soul and you know jesus said what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul so you know when jesus arrived on the scene 2000 years ago uh you know the jewish people had not really been thinking much at all about their soul uh for the most part it was all about here and now they were even looking for an earthly messiah an earthly king to come and deliver them and then jesus came along and kind of blew that out of the water no wonder so many jewish people um wanted nothing to do with him and even to this day want nothing to do with him because they assumed that 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 their idea of a Messiah was the right one. And Jesus came along and said, now let me tell you who the Messiah is. I am he, and this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm about. And 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 a lot of the Jews, including like the Pharisees, of course, uh, the religious leaders, they're like, no, 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 we know who the Messiah is going to be, and you're not it. So um, so they hated him. Um, they despised him. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's been hatred for Jesus ever since uh, among Jews and Gentiles. Uh, you know, Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. He didn't do son what what many people thought he should do. And and uh, you know what? He is God uh, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So whatever he does is right. And and if uh, if we're not quite uh, in sync with that, then we need to get with his program. It's not a matter of Jesus getting with our program. Uh, he is the Creator. He is the Redeemer, and he is the Savior of the world. Whether a person you know chooses to believe that or not. You know, Dan, you mentioned um, the blindness that people suffer when it comes to the realities of hell. You know, we talk about on the show, you know, sitting at the intersection of faith and pop culture and talking about the the stories that go on and how um, people are influenced by the social media accounts that they follow and through celebrities and other people of so-called influence and when you take a look at some of the influences that these influencers are putting out there, they make hell out to be like a party. You know, there's many song lyrics about partying down in, in hell or, or celebrities, musicians talking about wanting to hang out with their friends in hell or, you know, how they're going to drink beer in hell or, you know, whatever. There's multiple things that people have said about, you know, how, what it's going to be like in hell from these influencers. And I think that's part of the problem that people don't really realize is that not only are they blinded by the actualities and the realities of it, but they're listening to the wrong people. They're listening to the people that don't know or have rejected what hell is actually about, and they're trying to make it, like, hip and cool. You know, kind of like when you're peer pressured in school, you know, you've got these kids or these friends or acquaintances that, you know, they want you to do something bad with them, so they kind of peer pressure you into it, and they put all kinds of, you know, hey, come on, only the cool kids do this. I remember smoking, you know, smoking was one of the anti-smoking campaigns was the peer pressure of people trying to get you to smoke and thinking that it's it's cool if you smoke or you're square if you don't and all this stuff. And I think that's part of it is that people listen to the celebrities, the influencers of society when they say hell's not that bad, it's going to be cool, we all get to go party, hang out with their friends and do all this stuff without realizing what the Bible says about it and the consequences of going down that path. Yeah, there definitely uh, are so many wrong ideas that people have, Son. You're right uh, about both heaven and hell. And 
Jesus spoke the truth in everything he said, and he spoke often about heaven and hell. And when he described hell, he talked about a place where uh, the fire never goes out. He talked about a place where everyone will be salted with fire, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I know that's very hard for us to hear and to try to imagine because hell is a terrible place. But the only reason hell is so terrible is because man's sin is so terrible to God. You know, hell, we're told in Matthew 25, was originally prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, The devil and his angels had been created as holy angels. They were serving God until Lucifer apparently got tired of of bowing before the Lord and the Lord getting all the glory. And and somehow Lucifer got it in his mind. Uh, I mean, Ezekiel tells us that his heart became proud on account of his beauty. Uh, Somehow he got it in his mind that, that he was worthy of some of that praise and honor and glory. And so he went to the dark side when there was no dark side. He, he invented it. Um, he invented the dark side. He, he, in essence, created the darkness. Um, you know, and, and what I, what I mean by that is he created, um, sin. He, he created evil. Uh, God is not the author of evil. God gave the angels free will. Uh, God gave man free will. And the Bible tells us that, that Lucifer rebelled in heaven. A third of the angels went with him. They were kicked out of heaven. And, and so hell was prepared for them, but then we also learn in scripture that uh, man's sin is so terrible that unless his sin is forgiven, then man is sent to hell to pay for his sins for eternity. Here again, it just blows our mind. We can't even begin to fathom what, what, what that's all about. But, but, you know, Scripture isn't their son so that we can um, understand it completely the way that, let's say, God understands it. Um, it's there so that we can understand what we need to know to be saved, to know God's love, to be in God's family, to have a relationship with God, to be safe from our sins, to be safe from hell, and to be granted eternal life in heaven. That doesn't mean we're going to be able to understand all the depths, all the, the deep things of heaven and hell. Now, when we get to heaven one day as believers, boy, we're going to start to experience it and uh, we're going to really be enjoying that. Uh, the Bible calls it a new heaven and a new earth. And, and so um, it certainly sounds to me and many others like uh, our eternal existence with God in heaven uh, may have, you know, some, some features that um, are not all that different than some of the things here on earth. But then again, the, the, it'll be on a much higher plane, a much higher level. Uh, it'll be perfect. And, and so it's very difficult to, um, to really picture that other than, you know, just some of the pictures we get in the Bible and like in the book of Revelation, you know, but I'll tell you one thing heaven won't be is it won't be generic. It won't just be just like this white large space where you're bored out of your skull and you're just looking for a magazine to read because, you know, you're so bored. I mean, again, here's the world's understanding. I mean, watch some of these movies, uh, you know, about heaven and, and, and you'll have this, this, this blank white space. Okay. Uh, heaven's going to be the opposite of that. It's going to be very colorful. Um, it, it's going to, you know, as, as, um, Don Piper described it as an explosion of the senses. Uh, I, I fully believe that's what's going to happen, we're going to have a capacity sign in our resurrection bodies to uh, appreciate even more, uh, far more than we can even appreciate here right now. And it's going to be a heightened existence, a heightened experience. Uh, It's going to be magnified many times over. The satisfaction will be out of this world, the joy, the peace, the worship of God, um, the celebration of Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins. Um, That's the focus of heaven, whereas hell, what's the focus there? suffering, uh, punishment, uh, agony. Uh, in, in Luke 16, there was a rich man in Lazarus and the rich man went to hell, not because he was rich, but because he loved his money and he did not know Christ. And, and so he, he ends up in hell. And what's interesting there, son, is that this discussion goes on and he, he's almost like begging for this opportunity to be able to go and warn his brothers so that they won't go to that place. But, but it, 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 it is interesting that one thing he didn't do you know, in that dialogue is he didn't ask to be, to get out of hell. 
because I believe that when a person arrives in hell, there's this deep awareness that they deserve to be there and they're never going to leave as hopeless as that is and, 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 and will be for everyone who, who lands there and, and is there right now. Um, I believe that that is that the sense that you have in hell that you know you're never going to get out. And, and we can't even fathom the, the, the depth of that despair. Uh, and then you have all the agony that goes along with it. So, um, you know, Satan, of course, comes along and tries to paint God out as some monster who would send people to hell. Well, I'll tell you what, um, if you want to believe that about God, then that's your choice. But I I would beg you not to. I would instead urge you to to look at um, the fact that God sent his only son uh, to suffer the punishment that you and I deserve to pay. And and you can choose to focus on God's love, or you can choose to focus only on his justice and only on the punishment that sinners will have in hell. And, and if you focus on that, and you're not basking in the love of God, uh, the gospel message, the good news, then sure, you might end up having a real attitude about God. You, you might even end up like one of these hardcore atheists who, you know, they'll go online and they'll refer to God as this monster, you know, this monster. Well, um, you know what? Um, he's not a monster. He's a, he, the Bible says God is love. Uh, but, but he is a God of justice who punishes sin. And that's why hell exists to punish sinners. We're all sinners. We're all guilty. We all deserve to go to hell. Scripture makes that clear, but we're granted grace when we receive Jesus as our Savior, our sins are covered. God uh, offers us that. And in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says to the believer, it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Notice the past tense. You have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. You talked about that earlier, Son. Not by works so that no one can boast. So that really is a summary of, of, of Christian faith right there. It comes by grace. It comes through faith. It's not by works. And if you think you can boast in the fact that you're a Christian and you do not understand Christianity, my friend, you simply don't understand it. Because what you can boast in, uh, rightly boast, and that is in the cross. Uh, Paul wrote in, in Galatians, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the minute you or I start to boast in our own righteousness, our own good deeds, our own noble efforts, we're getting way off track. And if we're not careful, we could end up losing our soul uh, if we are at a point where we're actually relying upon those things to get into heaven. It won't happen. No one will ever get into heaven and be told, well, hey, you know, you did just enough to get in. You know, you worked just hard enough to get in. You, 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 you prayed just enough prayers and you did just enough good things. No, no. The only way to get into heaven uh, is through God's grace through faith in, in what Jesus did, the work he did on the cross. You see, it's not the work we do that gets us into heaven. It's the work that he did. So, so that's the message that we share. Um, that's the gospel that changed uh, the, uh, the persecutor of Christians, Saul of Tarsus, that, that early terrorist uh, in, the, in the Christian church. Uh, he was converted. Uh, he became then uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, the Lord told him on that Damascus road when he was, uh, when he was saved and converted. He said, I'm sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. Well, what is that? Well, the power of Satan uh, is, is all over you when you're an unbeliever. Uh, the power of Satan is all over you when you're a non-Christian uh, because you're in his camp. Um, you're, you're, uh, you're in his clutches. Um, the only thing that's going to liberate you is the Holy Spirit bringing you to faith in the gospel. Well, how does that happen? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Really? Yeah. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Really? Yes, everyone who trusts in the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, those are all scripture verses. They're all promises. They're all true. And that son is, is the message we share. But really, to go to your point, um, yes, the world misunderstands hell uh, completely. Uh, and, and if anybody thinks hell is going to be a party with warm beer, um, they will tragically uh, learn that, that it is so different than that. But, but you see, they don't have to. They don't have to go there. There's still time for those right now, son, who are still alive, there's still time to repent and believe the good news. You know, Dan, I've heard um, a couple sayings, you know, it's harder to believe than not to. And I've heard the reverse. It's harder not to believe. It's, you know, believing is simple. Um, and so you have 
you know, Christians or people that do follow um, biblical principles and teachings on both ends of the spectrum. You know, some say it's harder to believe that Jesus would do something like that and just to have faith. And then on the other side, people are like, it's simple. I mean, it's the simplest thing. It's harder not to believe. It's harder to reject because of the simplicity. Like, why would you want to rely on yourself? Why would you want to work your way into heaven? Why would you want to do all this stuff when all you have to do is accept? It's like, you know, a gift. If you were to get a birthday present, someone just comes and gives it to you. You don't have to go out and work for it. You don't have to go out and earn the money for it. You don't have to go out and do anything for it. It's just given to you by somebody else. So what would you rather do? Go out and work for it and put all the sweat and all the tears and all that into it and try to make it or just have the belief that it's going to be given to you, you know, a true belief, not one of these false beliefs, but a true belief that, you know, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved like it says in Acts. Um, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved like in Romans. Um, What do you think? Do you think it's, if you were to be, be posed that question, is it harder to believe than not to? What might a response be for for someone that may or may not think that way, um, that it's a harder to be to believe in Jesus than to just live in this world? Yeah, that's a good question, Son. And I think one way I might approach it with a person is, is this. I would say, well, why don't we look at the event that if it happened, um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and and all the messianic prophecies about him are true, and everything he said is true, and if it didn't happen, well, then we could just scrap the whole thing. And I'm referring now to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, because I do believe, Son, that it is much uh, harder, much harder uh, to... Um, reject uh, the evidence than it is to accept the evidence for the resurrection. If, if you look at it um, from a reasonable point of view, um, and, and, and you look at the fact that these followers of Christ, these disciples, um, they, like their fellow Jews who were not yet believers in Jesus, they had this idea in their mind that their Messiah would be a, a, an earthly king and bring them an earthly deliverance. It wasn't until later after Pentecost that, that they came to understand really much more about the spiritual implications of that. Uh, but, but why that's so significant, Son, is this. Okay, um, those disciples, more than anyone else, were, were devastated when Jesus was crucified. They were devastated by by what had happened. Uh, the, the scriptures tell us they were hiding for fear of the Jews. They 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 were afraid they're going to be next. You know, they were they were scared to death uh, after after that happened. And what history shows us is this, son. Um, the scripture records that 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 Jesus uh, was was not in the tomb when um, some women rushed to the tomb and found it empty. And by the way, son, if 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 the authors of the New Testament were trying to convince people that Jesus rose from the grave when he really didn't, let's say, um, you're you're not going to put as part of your testimony uh, that it was women who first discovered the tomb empty. Because in that day, women, their testimony was not even allowed uh, in in Jewish courts. Um, women were not uh, viewed as, as equal with men. It was Jesus who introduced this idea uh, of this equality. Now, of course, you, you can find um, God all the way back to the Old Testament, you know, creating man and woman uh, as, as as equal. But what I'm saying is the world had really lowered the role of women. Jesus elevated that role of women. But, but even in Jesus's day, um, a woman's testimony would not have carried nearly the weight of a man's testimony. So the very fact 
that we learn uh, from the New Testament that it was women who came to the tomb first, um, that that's not something you put in there unless it really happened and unless you're you're more interested in presenting the truth than, than you are in, in, in trying to, uh, pr- pr- you know, present a case that might might convince someone based on what they would expect to hear. So so women women were at the tomb, um, but then Jesus appeared to his disciples, and then he appeared to a group of more than 500 at one time, but here's where the evidence really kicks in, Son. These dejected disciples who... Had, had been thinking like their, you know, fellow Jews that the Messiah will, will bring us an earthly deliverance right now. Um, they would have had to have absolutely been convinced that Jesus rose from the dead before they would have gone out to do what history shows us they did. Um, you know, many of them went on to be martyred for their faith. Uh, they all went out preaching, um, you know, the gospel. Uh, I mean, obviously not, not Judas. I mean, we know about him, but, but, but Jesus's uh, apostles went out and proclaimed the good news. Many of them killed for their faith. And here's the thing, son, and this is where the evidence kicks in and why I believe it's so much uh, harder to reject the resurrection than it is to to accept it even if you don't even if you don't initially let's say accept um you know the bible uh as as being you know god's word um even if initially you're not even approaching it that way because uh, i'll tell you what the, the new testament these historic or historical records they present history and and historians understand that based on um all of the manuscripts that we have based upon on just the um, the authenticity of these of these historical records, and what they tell us is that is that these disciples went out and and they died for the message, and that doesn't happen in history. You you don't ever find a group of people uh, who go out and are willing to die for a lie if they know that it's a lie. Um, for example, when the terrorists flew into the uh, Twin Towers on 9-11, um, they died for a lie, but they didn't know it was a lie. They assumed it was the truth. They believed it was the truth. In fact, they, they, they believed it so much they were willing to die for it, okay? But they didn't know that it was a lie until the moment after they died, and, 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 and they realized, hey, wait a minute, you know, this isn't uh, the paradise that we were told we were going to have with all these virgins waiting for us, and, and, and they found themselves uh, in Hades, uh, just like the, the rich man in Luke 16, where um, to this day he is still in torment, he is still in agony, and, and that's where the terrorists found themselves, you know, right after um, they, they committed their, their despicable act. But see, the disciples, son, um, they... If, if, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, they would have known it better than anybody. So, so what? Well, what are we supposed to think and believe? That they got together, um, you know, they were, they were terrified after he was killed. But all of a sudden, what? They, they, they had like this, this burst of energy. They said, hey, wait a minute, guys. We're looking at this all wrong, okay? Yeah, they could come and kill us, but forget that. Let's go out and tell people that we've seen Jesus, okay? Let, 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 let's go out and spread this fabrication um, that we've seen Jesus, and and maybe that'll make us feel better, and, and we'll, you know, no, son, th- you know, that would have been, um, that that would have been a ticket to death. And guess what? It was. They went out and told that story because it was true and because they were willing to die for it. You're not going to be willing to die for that, son, if you know it's a lie. Nobody does that. They would never have done that. So the evidence is overwhelming um, on on the side of the resurrection happening. Um, Christianity would never have gotten off the ground. The Messiah's critics could not produce his body body, his dead body. Why? Because he was alive. Um, he was no longer in the grave. All they had to do, son, was come up with the dead body of Jesus. Oh, yeah, at least Christians are saying that he, he rose from the dead. Yeah, come over here. Look at this. Here he is. No, they didn't have him. Uh, you can't contain the creator. You can't contain the redeemer. Um, you can't you can't stop Jesus from rising from the dead. Um, you can't stop the gospel from going forth. So that's that would be one way, son, I would, I would answer that. If somebody says, well, 
probably easier to believe um, or or easier to to reject the message. Um, I think it's far easier to accept the evidence. Now, uh, having accepted that evidence, then, son, it still then, of course, is necessary for a person to put their faith in Christ. So if you look at the evidence with an open mind and, and you say, well, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it, it seems then like, yeah, he, he must have risen from the dead. Now, take that little small step that's left of faith where now you place your faith in a ruined Savior and what he said about himself. For example, when he said in John 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? So, so that's then the little small steps on after a person you know, really looks at the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, hopefully, you know, they, they, they come to see, yeah, I mean, this is way too hard to reject. I, you know, it, it, it would take me placing faith in something that's just illogical in something that could never happen, would never happen. Um, you know, these, these, uh, you know, fishermen and others, I mean, the, the, these were for the most part, you know, you know, these were simple men, you know, they, they weren't out, they weren't out there in any way trying to pull one over on, on their Jewish, uh, counterparts that, you know, and the last thing they would have done after they'd already, you know, taken up everything to go and follow Jesus as, as the Messiah, the last thing they're going to do, son, in, in their dejected, discouraged, fearful state is to come up with some um, brainstorm. Hey, yeah, let, 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 let's just go say that we saw him. Let's go pretend that we did that. I mean, for what? For death? For a lie? No, no. Show me anybody in history, any group that did that, and I might be willing to think, okay, yeah, maybe Maybe that can happen. But I tell you what, it didn't happen. It wouldn't have happened. That is evidence on for the resurrection. And it takes a tremendous amount of faith, in my opinion, in, in blind faith, in uh, to, to, to go against that evidence. You know, like if you're sitting in a jury uh, and, and all the evidence is pointing to this person as having done something, and they've got DNA evidence, and they've got, you know, witnesses, and they've got all this and that, um, and then and then you're saying, no, I don't think he did it. Well, why? I mean, what, what, what are you basing your, your faith on and your decision on? Well, I don't know. Just a feeling. I guess I have. No, no. We have we, now when there's evidence. You don't have to rely on feelings when there's DNA. And I'll tell you what, son. You don't have to rely on feelings when we have the res, uh, the evidence for the resurrection that we have that Jesus rose from the dead and, and Christianity not only got off the ground, it, it flourished. It has been for two thousand years. Um, only because Jesus truly did rise from the dead. So people are wise to press the point upon themselves to where they, you know, as C.S. Lewis, uh, you know, really pressed it. You know, you can accept Jesus as three, one of three things. Either he was a liar, either he was a lunatic, or he is the Lord of all. And if he is, then you owe him your allegiance. You owe him your life. Uh, you, you, you owe him, um, a surrender where you bow before him and accept him as your savior. Uh, but what some people want to do, son, is they want to do the illogical and the impossible. They want to say, well, Jesus was just a good prophet. He was just a good man, but you know, he's not my savior. He's not the son of God. Wait a minute. He never, he never claimed to just be another prophet or a good man. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be uh, God in the flesh. Uh, you know, he claimed to be able to forgive sins. And that's why the, the religious leaders hated him so much and accused him of blasphemy, because in their minds, they thought, hey, he's not God. You know, he's just this carpenter's son uh, from Nazareth. I mean, um, you know, and and uh, and yet he, he was who he said he is, and um, uh, he is the eternal God. And so the evidence is there, but as Josh McDowell wrote, uh, you know, in his classic uh, book years ago, uh, titled Evidence That Demands a Verdict, um, you know, son, every person gets to be a member of the jury and, and they get to decide, you know, yes or no on Jesus. And, and so that, that's the, that's what uh, is presenting, every, is presented to everyone today, um, Jesus, and you decide, you know, is he your savior or isn't he? But if he is, then you owe him your life. And certainly, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll need to place your faith in him because that's how you're going to be born again and saved. You know, Dan, you've got um, people out there, for example, Lee Strobel is probably the most noted one. Um, he was working for the you know newspaper in Chicago, and 
I think his wife, as the story goes, you know, became a Christian first, and he wanted to set out to disprove this Jesus. You know, he wanted to set out to disprove um, this Christian faith. And through the process of trying to disprove it, or at least just through the process of just investigating it, it turned out that he realized it to be true and ultimately gave his life to Christ. You think of Nabil Koresh, um, you know, a Muslim who's no longer with us, but his story of, you know, uh, seeking Allah, finding Jesus, you know, he went out there and he was seeking something kind of, you know, again, debunking or trying to, you know, create this Christian faith as a myth, Jesus just as a person, whatever. And it turned out that in his quest for Allah, he found Christ. And so you see this intent on people who are out there to disprove, and that's their mission, but yet, kind of like what Paul did when he was persecuting Christians, but yet they find the truth, and I'm sure they come to this search with, you know, blinders on. They're looking for every little thing, you know. If you if you find, if you want to find something, you know, you'll find something in every little thing. We see in politics all the time, you know, people are trying to find something in Trump, and so they go after every little thing, but then when they see something in, like, a, uh, Biden, for example, like the... Uh, documents, you know, that Trump had in his place versus Biden had in his place, the so-called class for documents, they'll look at one thing and jump on that and attack it. Like, see, I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. But then they'll kind of ignore this stuff over here, even though that's the true speaking over here. But you see these two guys, for example, and when they're searching, even with their biases and whatever it is that they were going after their intent, it, they got turned around Their life changed. They realized that the gospel is true that there's truth to this, that Jesus is real. And then they gave their life to Christ. And then from that point on, they their life's mission was to spread the gospel, whether through books, speakings, whatever. And so it's almost like if somebody out there listening that is intent on not believing or has questions, whatever the case may be, if you actually seek and investigate and try it, you might realize that it's a life-changing discovery that you're going to find. And even though you're hell-bent on trying to disprove this faith, if you go and investigate it and try it out, you might find that what you're actually seeking is truth and what you're now, what you were claiming before was actually not the truth, the life that you wanted. And so, again, for people that might be listening, like, oh, this Christian stuff is investigate it. Check it out because there's evidence of people that have, even modern day, that have intently gone after Christianity to try to disprove it. And in in the end, they end up proving it. And, and you got to read Lee Strobel's story to really, I mean, he investigated. He was an investigative journal. He investigated. He went to these different places, investigated these, you know, teachings and did this whole investigative thing. It wasn't just a, a wing and a prayer. And he found that there was a lot of truth to all of this that the Bible was talking about, factual truth, like you mentioned before, spiritual truth. And in the end, he realized that the conversion his wife had was real, and he won the same thing. Yes, yeah, that is very well said. And if only people, as you say, would just you know, look at some of these lives, some of these testimonies um, of people, you know, a little while ago today, I was looking again at the website One for Israel, which I would encourage people to go and check out that website, um, O-N-E, One for Israel. Uh, and and it's a, a site, really the best one in the world, that has uh, testimonies of Jewish people who have accepted uh, Yeshua, Jesus, as Messiah. And it's just fascinating to listen to some of their testimonies uh, of these Jewish people who've, who've come to see Jesus uh, as the way, the truth, and the life. And as you say, Son, if a person would just... Um, would just come and see, uh, you know, it's like the Bible verse that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, but you have to taste. You know, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Um, he who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Uh, Jesus is food for the soul. He is the bread of life. But you have to taste. Uh, you, you have to believe in him in order to really taste of his goodness. Uh, I think of the passage in, in uh, James, it says, come near to God and he will come near to you. 
Uh, you know, I was I was listening to a um, a little bit of a uh, dialogue. I guess it was from a few years back of Ben Shapiro um, and uh, uh, and and Jordan Peterson. And it was very interesting, but, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I take that back. I take that back. Um, Ben Shapiro and William Lane Craig, William Lane Craig. And William Lane Craig was presenting some, uh, really a defense, uh, some points uh, to do with Christianity um, and the Bible, and, and specifically then the resurrection. And he laid out these very strong historical points for the resurrection did William Lane Craig. And when he was all said and done, you know, Ben Shapiro, you know, very gently, but, but honestly just said, Hey, he just kind of, he, he finds it, you know, pretty uninteresting. Um, well, okay. Here's the deal with that. All right. Um, you know, of all people who have a vested interest in the Messiah, it's the Jewish people of which, you know, Ben Shapiro is, he's an Orthodox Jew. Um, the only way you find those historical facts uninteresting is if there's something deeper going on in your heart that the Bible describes as a, a veil over your heart, um, where you're not even, you, you, you're not, you're not only not open to believing in Jesus, you don't even have a legitimate interest in the historical facts and evidence, which I say, son, I say that's illogical. I say that doesn't make sense that someone as smart as Ben Shapiro um, on an issue as critical as the Messiah would be genuinely uninterested in, in, in what are the, the most powerful historical facts of the resurrection. Something deeper is going on, and that points to the, the, the spiritual, the supernatural um, blindness. As it says again in, in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So, um, yes, I... Uh, you know, a, a person can come near to God and he'll come near to you. Um, but, but if you so close your mind to the evidence, if you so close your mind to the history, if you so close your mind to the argument behind Christianity, um, it's going to be quite difficult uh, for you to be born again. I mean, yeah, you might be, you know, uh, one of those rare people who, uh, you know, like Saul of Tarsus, has this encounter with Jesus, uh, and he did on the Damascus Road. You might be like one of those Muslims that we hear about today, where, where Jesus comes to them in a dream, and, and they're converted because they meet Jesus in a dream. Um, you might be like someone like that. But but if you haven't had one of those experiences that, that's convinced you that Jesus is who he says he is, um, my encouragement to you, my friend, would be open your mind to the evidence. Um, for example, son, I wish that every Jewish family, rather than telling their children, as many Jewish parents do, um, you know, Jesus is not even an option. Don't even bring his name up. Um, you know, he's just taboo in most Jewish homes. It, it, it's why, son, so many Jewish rabbis won't even read Isaiah 53 in the synagogue because it so clearly points to, to Jesus as the suffering servant, um, as, as the one who was, uh, you know, pierced for our uh, transgressions. Uh, they won't even look at that. Um, why? Because there's, there is such a bias against Jesus, and it's ingrained in so many Jewish Jewish homes, so many Jewish children, um, and and, and but, but instead of that, imagine if Jewish families would say, okay, um, you know, pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my child, pray to God and ask him to reveal the truth to you about Yeshua, about Jesus. If only Jewish homes would do that, it'd be very exciting to see how many of those children then would be would be brought to faith in Jesus. But but because they're so convinced. Son, uh, it, it absolutely cannot be him. Uh, it, it, you know, it absolutely cannot be because they would say, "Well, that, that's the Christian God. That's the Christian Savior." And, and, and Satan has done quite a number.
number upon the, the minds of Jewish people to convince them that, that, that somehow Yeshua is not their Messiah. When What does it even say in the New Testament? What does Paul write? That the gospel is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. I mean, even in the New Testament, you know, not just the Old Testament, we say, well, yeah, God, God's people in the Old Testament, obviously, you know, the Jewish people. Well, we come to the New Testament, and, and the gospel itself is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Um, so, so you would hope and pray, Son, that, that, that Jewish parents would, would, would encourage their kids to pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, ask him to reveal the truth to them. But that doesn't seem to be happening uh, in the vast majority of Jewish homes. And so I would encourage people, and if you know anyone who, who's Jewish, um, maybe uh, encourage them to check out some of these testimonies at One for Israel. Uh, these are powerful testimonies. We'll bless you. You don't have to be Jewish to get blessed by these testimonies. Now, these are Jewish believers or, you know, Messianic Jews. That is, Jews who've accepted Jesus as their Savior. But you don't have to uh, be Jewish to appreciate what they're saying. Um, any Christian can, can listen to that and rejoice because it's so powerful what, what Jesus has done to, uh, to transform the lives of, of, these, uh, of these believers now, these Messianic Jews. Um, and, and so it's um, yeah. It, it, it's there's a lot of evidence out there. Um, uh, a lot of people feel like they've already got the answer to it. And, and, you know, son, maybe, maybe you or I, or the listeners can think of a time in our own life when like, boy, we were so sure that something wasn't even going to be an option. But then the more we looked at it, we heard some things from other people. We tried it out ourselves. Lo and behold, wow, Hey, this actually works. You know, and you, you could apply that to a whole host of things in life where maybe at one point, um, you know, you're convinced it's not an option. And then all of a sudden you have a change of mind and that's just on something here in this world. Uh, how much, more critical is it, Son, that, that people come to know Jesus while there's still time? Because again, as we said at the beginning, uh, we're dealing with your immortal soul. And, um, you know, my friend, you will exist forever in one of two places. Nothing you can do will change that. I hope and pray you would never commit suicide. Uh, but when a person does commit suicide, even that does, does not in any way um, touch the fact that their soul is immortal. All that does is sends them on, you know, to their eternal destination a little bit sooner, maybe than they might have otherwise gone. But you are an immortal being. Um, you will exist in one of two places. And, and this is where I'll, I'll go back again for, for Ben Shapiro to say he's uninterested in William Lane Craig's um, points. Um, there's something very, very deep going on when a super intelligent man like Ben Shapiro uh, seems genuinely uninterested there's a fog, there's a glaze, there's a veil, there's a spiritual, supernatural uh, blinder up on the heart and the mind. And um, boy, that's, that's, the, that's the difficult thing, Son, in, in reaching people for Christ is, um, you know, that, 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 spiritual, um, that, 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 that spiritual blinder that, that, that man wears. And uh, the gospel is the power of God to the salvation of them who believe. So we, we, we preach the gospel. We share the gospel. Um, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. The gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, which means it's for the whole world. Christ Christ died for sins once for all. And that includes you, my friend, today, if you're listening, and I would encourage you, um, pray to God today. Pray these seven words. Wash me, Jesus, with your precious blood. Wash me, Jesus, with your precious blood. You watch what happens if you get real with God today. If you come near to God, he will come near to you. If you taste and see that the Lord is good, you will definitely uh, begin to enjoy what you're tasting there of the bread of life with Jesus in your soul, the Holy Spirit, um, now making your body a temple of God. Uh, there'll be peace from God, uh, joy from the Lord, and you'll never be the same. I mean, you won't be perfect in this life, far from it, but, but you'll have peace like you've never had, and, and God will show you now that heaven is your eternal home, and then you're going to start to get involved with reaching some of your family and friends and other people with this message, because you're going to be like, hey, um, 
Um, now I get it. I wish I'd have started this years ago, but now I get it. So go to that one for Israel website, check out those testimonies. And if people who were raised in Jewish homes and told never even mention the name Jesus, if people like that are coming to faith in Christ, you can too. I don't know what your background is, but you can too. Uh, it's very, very doable. Um, and the Holy spirit will bring you to faith. Uh, but today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Dan Dozell with us. You can find his writings at uh, christianpost.com. This particular one is uh, talking about God, the gospel, being dynamite for the soul. And so, Dan, we appreciate your time and your insights, and we look forward to many more conversations, God willing. Oh, amen, son. It's totally my pleasure, and um, I've sure enjoyed our visit today, as always. I look forward to our next one. You can check out our website at RadioWarp.com. That's Radio W-A-R-P, RadioWarp.com. Just click on the Sanctified Reason podcast logo, and all of our shows will pop up there. If you like this one and want to listen to some others, um, you can definitely do that. Also, you can reach out. Our email is SanctifiedReasonPodcast at gmail.com. That's SanctifiedReasonPodcast at gmail.com. Hey, thanks for listening. Do tell a friend, and until next time, God bless.